and I gave you part one titled The Midnight Cry and today it will be part two of The Midnight Cry. In fact, we'll only be able to cover one text today in the parable of the ten virgins verse 6 says and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him now this parable as all the parables of Jesus they're not fictitious stories given to illustrate spiritual truth they are true stories and at the moment that he told this parable they were actually watching this take place down in the valley <coughs> and these ten uh, ladies which apparently was typical for a Jewish wedding to have ten bridesmaids and they were down there uh, waiting for the bridegroom to come and then they would follow the bridegroom to the celebration but the, the hours kept going by and he didn't come finally it hit midnight and at midnight someone who was awake cried out behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him now this has a parallel earlier in history in uh, the book great controversy page 402 it connects this call to the triumphal entry of jesus when he was going into jerusalem upon the occasion of christ's triumphal entry into jerusalem the people who were assembled from all parts of the land to keep the feast flocked to the Mount of Olives and as they joined the throng that were escorting Jesus they caught the inspiration of the hour and helped to swell the shout blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord so these two statements are linked together when the message went out behold the bridegroom cometh it was an exciting message given unto the power of the Holy Spirit and those that were receiving the message they also got uh, lifted up and it was a very exciting event to consider that the bridegroom was coming just like those that went with Jesus had the same experience in like manner <coughs> did unbelievers who flocked to the Adventist meetings some from curiosity some merely to ridicule feel the convincing power attending the message behold the bridegroom cometh so when they preached Behold, the bridegroom cometh. It was not an ordinary sermon. It was a sermon that was attended with a special power of God because it wasn't going to be very long until an extremely important event was going to take place. Now, they thought it was actually the literal coming of Jesus, but it turned out that that wasn't the message, the purpose of the message, but the purpose was to prepare them for Jesus moving from the holy place into the most holy place and enter his final work before he would return. So when Jesus was going to the temple, the Holy Spirit attended those shouts of, of Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And as the Millerites were giving the second angel's message it had similar power and it excited and enthused those that listened to that message now here are some texts 
that they used in announcing this, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. They didn't know what that meant fully, but they believed that it meant Jesus was coming back to cleanse this earth with fire. However, the cleansing of the sanctuary had to do with the heavenly sanctuary. Another text that they used was Daniel 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. And their understanding stopped at the comma. And they saw in that that Jesus was coming back to the earth and that they were announcing his arrival. But there's another part. And came to the Ancient of Days. Later they would discover that. It's not saying he will come to the earth with clouds, but that he will come to the Ancient of Days or to the Father. And came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now this next one, they didn't, think about too much until after the disappointment in Malachi 3.1. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger. The messenger was William Miller and those that joined him. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, not to earth, but to his temple. And so they realized, oh, it's talking about suddenly when we thought he was going to arrive at earth, suddenly he appears in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. And so these uh, first two texts were used to announce the bridegroom cometh and the other one they understood later. Now, in one sense, the first angel was announcing the bridegroom cometh, but in a very specific sense, it doesn't apply until the time pointed out here, Great Controversy 398. In the summer of 1844, Midway between the time when it had been first thought that the 2300 days would end and the autumn of the same year, to which it was afterward found that they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So they said those literal words. They understood the parable. And that they were announcing, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And that started around June of uh, 1844 and extended to October uh, 22, 1844. There had been the first disappointment in the spring. And for a time they were kind of disoriented and they didn't really know what was going on. But once they discovered the exact date, that Jesus was going to move, then they could speak and the Holy Spirit gave incredible power to the message that they were giving. Why was it at midnight? Christ Object Lessons 414 explains the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, which we think of as the darkest hour. I, I think it's not actually true, but people still think that. And so that was picked, midnight. Actually, the darkest time is just before dawn. But uh, the reason the word midnight was picked here is because it would happen at the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. Now this parable is not only telling us history, but is 
it is telling us the future. And so, just like it was at midnight that the Millerites preached this message, so Seventh-day Adventists are called to preach, Behold, the bridegroom cometh in earth's darkest hour. The days of Noah and Lot pictured the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. So we have an example in the experience that existed when Noah was preaching. And if you've studied anything about what kind of reception Noah got, he didn't get much. And there was a lot of ridicule and uh, people thought he, thought he was crazy. And then we have Lot, the time of Lot. We're a little more familiar with what it was like in Sodom before this happened. I never thought I would see some of the things that have happened recently in this country, which have made us more like Sodom than ever before. I mean, there's always been these sins going on, but to legalize them, to punish people who are against them, and that type of thing, it is truly getting close to the time when God's people are to be giving, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. <clears throat> the scriptures pointing forward to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Satan is fully aware how late it is. And he is extremely busy producing midnight in the world and in this country where we are. So that was true back then, but it also is true again. Page 145, same book. Satan's working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness. And then it tells us some of what is causing the darkness. The multitudinous errors, heresies, and delusions of these last days. So people are getting fooled by all kinds of errors in every field. Recently I was looking uh, on the internet for to purchase something and I saw a very low price and so I started contacting and I discovered that it was a scam. And it, in every field the deception is just mounting. Also I've noticed that companies are getting sued more than ever in my lifetime for the deceptions that they're practicing on the public, for saying that certain ingredients are in the product and they're not in there. And, you know, and then the one that's most dangerous probably for us is deceptions in the spiritual realm. Uh, errors, heresies, and delusions. And so we are certainly uh, I don't know how much darker it can get. It's, it's getting about to that point. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know whether it's been troubling to you. If you don't know about it, you're probably uh, happier. But if you are somewhat aware of the deceptions that your brothers and sisters are falling into in this church, it, it brings a heartache and you wonder why, with all the light that we have, why do they have to get deceived? Why do they have to get tripped up in those things? But Satan is busy. And I've noticed something about the deceptions that he's bringing now. You can't say that it's 100% error. But what is going on is that they leave out certain important facts. 
And so what they're telling us is true, but it makes us off balance because we're not hearing the rest of the story. We're not getting the whole picture. And this is the most subtle, the most dangerous uh, heresies. And of course, he's going to send those to the Adventist church because of the light that we do have available. The great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight. That's how bad it's going to get. Impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. I'd read that phrase many times, but I didn't really know what it meant. But I looked it up, and it's a, it's a cloth that's made out of goat's hair, but it has to be black, goat's hair. And so they wore that when they were mourning uh, sackcloth of hair. To God's people, it will be a night of trial. So this is not going to be an easy time. And one of the reasons why it's not going to be an easy time is the friction and the mistreatment of brothers and sisters to us during this time. It will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. In other words, God comes always at midnight. When Jesus made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, it was midnight. Because <clears throat> by that time, the leaders had fully decided that he was an imposter, that he was not the Messiah. And if they could have kept him out of the temple, they would have kept him out. But there was so much power attending Jesus coming into the temple, and he was in there for most of the week, and there was nothing they could do about it. There was so much power attending him that they had to wait until he left the temple. And so it was... <coughs> As the Millerites in the summer through the fall of 1844, they gave the message with so much power. Even those that came to disturb the meetings, they, they weren't able to. The Holy Spirit controlled them from being able to do that. And so this uh, midnight cry is an exciting message for us to be able to be a part of. And we're going to have that privilege and it will be the most powerful message that has ever been given on earth because it will be under the power of the latter rain. In Great Controversy 370 it says, The proclamation of a definite time for Christ's coming called forth great opposition from many of all classes. From the minister in the pulpit down to the most reckless, <coughs> heaven-daring sinner. So there is always a truth. When the midnight cry is given, there's always a truth that is despised. The one, when Jesus went in the temple... <coughs> was the idea that he was the Messiah. That was a despised message. When the Millerites gave their message, the idea that Jesus was coming to earth and stop all their partying and all their uh, wickedness was a truth that they hated. They didn't want to have that happen. When the midnight cry is given in the future, we know what the issue is. It's the Sabbath. Have you noticed how people are thinking, it doesn't matter. How could it possibly matter? If we keep one day in seven, how can it possibly matter that it has to be the seventh day that we keep? And various other lines of reasoning are going to cause people to hate that message. 
the words of prophecy were fulfilled. There shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So they're thinking time is going to go on. This is just somebody that's alarmed, but they don't need to be alarmed. Time is going to go on. It's been that way, and it's going to be that way in the future. Now, for those that have to go through, here's a comforting uh, thing to know. First selected, uh, no, first spiritual gifts, page 155. The message given from heaven enraged Satan and his angels. And those who profess to love Jesus but despised his coming, scorned and derided the faithful trusting ones. Now, here's the good part. But an angel marked every insult, every slight, every abuse they received from their professed brethren. So the persecution came from fellow church members. And the church churches were divided into two groups, those that accepted the message and those that ridiculed the message and sometimes when we get in those kind of situations, we feel very alone. We can feel that God doesn't care about what's going on. He does, he's not doing anything to deliver us. He's just letting us suffer. But the encouraging message here is that is not true. He is keeping track of everything that God said, everything that God done, and there will come a day when he will take revenge upon those that don't repent. So we are to wait. That's, you know, one of the qualities that we need in the last days is patience. And we have to wait until God takes care of it and put up with it while we have to, while we have to put up with it. And maybe we could even be like some who rejoiced that they were persecuted uh, for the name of Jesus. But God will take care of it. He never neglects it. In Great Controversy 372, it tells a little bit where, where was the source of the opposition. As the people were roused and began to inquire the way of salvation, religious teachers stepped in between them and the truth seeking to quiet their fears by falsely interpreting the word of God. Unfaithful watchmen united in the work of the great deceiver, crying, peace, peace, when God had not spoken peace. Like the Pharisees in Christ's day, <clears throat> many refused to enter the kingdom of heaven themselves, and those who were entering in, they hindered. Now here's where I don't think very many Seventh-day Adventists are prepared. They think that the only opposition to the, the message, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, they think the only opposition is from non-Seventh-day Adventist pastors. They don't believe that it could ever happen that Seventh-day Adventist pastors would do this. But this is history, what happened. It was practically all the pastors and, you know, of whatever church it was. Uh, because the Millerites didn't have a church. Toward the end, they kind of started having their own camp meetings because they were forbidden to be a part of the other churches. But uh, this is history that is a prediction for the future. Now, who was it 
in the midnight cry, who was it that gave the message? Both when Jesus made the triumphal entry and when the Millerites gave it. Who was it that gave it? Great Controversy 368. There were comparatively few ministers, however, who would accept this message. Therefore, it was largely committed to humble laymen. Farmers left their fields, mechanics their tools, traders their merchandise, professional men their positions. Now, a pastor is trained that he knows better. And so when he doesn't give the message and lay people start rising up and giving the message, you can guess what kind of opposition there's going to be. It's kind of like, well, if God had a message for his people, he would certainly use us. He wouldn't use you to give the message. He would use us. And that's exactly what happened in the Jewish church. And that's, that's the reason why the leaders of the Jewish church turned off the message because they didn't believe that God would bypass them and give the message to Laman. In uh, Great Controversy 380, it says the fact that the message was to a great extent preached by Laman was urged as an argument against it. As of old, the plain testimony of God's word was met with the inquiry. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed? So the question that went around is, is there any leader that accepts this message? And yes, there were a few, but not very many. Only a few of those who had been the leaders were involved in this new message that was going with great power. Now, who accepted the message? Great Controversy 372. Those who studied the Bible for themselves, wherever the people were not controlled by the influence of the clergy, wherever they would search the Word of God for themselves, the Advent doctrine needed only to be compared with the Scriptures. So it gives two groups of people uh, they were really the same, but two identifying marks. Who was willing to accept the message? Number one, those who personally studied the Bible. They didn't depend on somebody else to tell them what the Bible was talking about, but they studied it for themselves. Generally speaking, in this country and probably worldwide, People leave their understanding of spiritual things to the pastor and they leave their understanding of health, uh, how to be healthy to their doctor. And so all the devil has to do is mislead the pastor, mislead the doctor, and he's got everybody. But there are some that are different. And the ones that were, st they studied the Bible for themselves they were protected from these dangers. And the second mark it mentions is those who did not worship or depend on the pastor. You know, uh, hero worship is very, very big in our country, and I'm sure, again, around the world. And there are certain favorite pastors that everybody gets excited about. And whatever they say, they believe it has to be right. Those are the special targets of the enemy. We need to pray for them because all that popularity is very dangerous. But even, you know, other pastors that have pretty good gifts, if we're not careful, we can look up to them beyond what we ought to. And those people that didn't do that they were prepared to say, well, my pastor says this, uh, but those that are giving the message say this, and I'm going to go to my Bible, and I'm going to find out which one is right. And those 
were the ones that accepted the message. There was persecution in Great Controversy 373. It says many were persecuted by their unbelieving brethren. In order to retain their position in the church, some consented to be silent in regard to their hope. So here we see a temptation that if I'm a church leader and uh, too many of the church members don't like what I believe and they will take away my office, then they thought, well, you know, I guess I won't let anybody know that I believe in this message, Behold, the Bridegroom cometh. Not a few were cut off from the fellowship of the church for no other reason than expressing their belief in the coming of Christ. So they were disfellowship. Now I've heard of quite a few people getting disfellowship from the Adventist church. I don't judge the situation. The church could have been right because I know some people are pretty antagonistic when they believe differently and pretty annoying. And so, you know, they may have caused uh, their church to get frustrated with them and disfellowship them. But some of them probably didn't deserve to be disfellowshipped. And so this, this will be a trial that some people will have to go through and experience very precious to those who bore this trial of their faith were the words of the prophet. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. Those that stick with the truth that respond to the message when it is given in the power of the Holy Spirit, they will suffer all these things. But again, God is paying attention and he will take care of them. And in the end, it will be seen that they were right. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I've been mentioning it, but this is the final call. In 8th Testimonies 2.12, it says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And the final application of that is just before us, not far in the future. So what is the counsel for us? Lose no time now in rising and trimming your lamps. Lose no time in seeking <coughs> perfect unity with one another. Now, of course, there are other references that tell us we will never be all unified together. There are two groups of people forming in the Adventist church. But we can be fully united with those who are also going to respond to the final message. And God is asking us to get full unity together. What does that mean? It means we don't criticize each other behind the back. It means that when somebody has a fault, we don't condemn them. We may pray for them. We may uh, go to them and talk to them about the change that we see needs to happen. But because we're in full unity together, we don't want to uh, say anything or do anything that's going to hurt another member. <clears throat> now is the time for us to seek, it says, perfect uh, unity with one another. And from Medical Ministry 331, May the Lord give wisdom to our brethren that they may know how to carry forward the work in harmony with his will. <clears throat> That's very important. Right now, we are to be studying and finding out 
How do we do God's work? Because it has to be done the way he said for it to be done. Just to give you an example, we cannot be using rock music to advance his work. He has not said that that's the way it should be done. And if we don't know, <coughs> we don't have much time to find out because it needs to be done according to his will. With mighty power, the cry is to be sounded in our large centers of population. Notice the future. It's not talking about the past anymore. It's talking about the future. <coughs> With mighty power, the cry is to be sounded in our large centers of population. And what is the cry? Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. It's the final message recorded there in Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. The final call, the final, the bridegroom cometh, and we have the privilege of being the ones to give that if we will learn from history and will become the kind of believers that God used back then, he will do it again <coughs> through those of us that are faithful. And nothing would make me happier than to know that every member of this church is on that team. So that, you know, there's no two groups here, but only one group. And that we can give the message in the power that God wants us to give it in.